Is Qatar playing a dangerous game in Syria? I'll ask the country's foreign minister, Khalid al -Atiyah. I'm Mehdi Hassan, also on the show. It's the viral video sparking outrage. A young black student in the United States thrown to the ground in class by a school officer. So, do black lives matter? I'll ask one of the movement's most prominent activists. But first, as Syria collapses, some say Gulf countries like Qatar are making things worse by backing violent and intolerant rebel groups. They've also been criticized for not taking in Syrian refugees. This week, I sat down with Qatar's foreign minister to talk Syria, Iran, and the controversy surrounding the 2022 World Cup. Our headliner, Khalid al -Atiyah. Foreign Minister, thanks for joining me on Upfront. The Qatari government says it cares about the Syrian people. It supports the people of Syria in their struggle. They're being oppressed, uh, expelled from their homes by their government. Can you tell me how many Syrian refugees Qatar has taken in this year? Yeah. It's not only, uh, Mahdi, how many Qatari uh, Syrian sorry, refugees we have in Qatar, but it's about how many uh, Syrian Qatar has been taken care of since the uh, crisis in Syria began. But as we speak today, we have about 54,000 Syrian in Qatar. We started 2011 with about 20,000 plus, and now we have 54,000 in, in Qatar, plus 7,000 Syrian are in a visit visa, which we are renewing it uh, to them. But those Syrians are on visit visas or work no, visas, we don't. they're not refugees. No, no, let me tell you this thing, that in Qatar we don't consider the Syrian are refugees at home. We take them in, we offer them jobs, we offer them all the uh, health care, uh, education, we build two schools for the Syrian in Qatar. We never think that the Syrian who comes to Qatar are refugees. We deal with them as brothers, and we give them all the care they need as Qataris. So when the United Nations says that as per their resettlement scheme for Syrian refugees, Qatar has taken zero compared to even small countries like Iceland, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, do you think that's unfair comparison when they yeah. say zero? Who said, who said so? According to the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, on their resettlement scheme for Syrian refugees, Qatar and the other Gulf countries have taken zero. No, this is not true. No. We have now, as I told you, we have 54,000. And for your, uh, you know, for the information is that we are, uh, as we speak today, through the education above all, uh, educated child, we are taking care of 600,000 child in Syria and out of Syria on the refugees camp, uh, teaching them. The root cause of the conflict is, of course, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and his war machine, and your strategy has been to try and topple Assad or get him to leave office uh, by funding and arming uh, Syrian opposition groups. You're now ratcheting up the rhetoric. You mentioned recently that Qatar would even consider, quote, military intervention to protect the Syrian people. Do you mean actual Qatari ground forces going in to fight the Syrian army, or are you referring to just more arms for the rebels? Because Hezbollah, uh, Syrian government voices have already threatened Doha with retaliation were you to get involved militarily. Well, uh, what I meant is the friend of Syria, the core group friend of Syria, will do whatever necessary to protect the Syrian people. This is what I meant exactly. Well, what, does it, what does that mean with, exactly? With all means to support the Syrian... So would you consider Qatari forces going in? No, this is out of question to have a soldier's uh, foot on the ground. And I think the Syrian people does not want any one of us to be on the ground. They Qatari, can liberate... Qatari airstrikes? No, no, they can liberate their country themselves. You talk about supporting... Uh, groups within Syria, the people of Syria, to fight. Uh, many people believe that in doing so, you've also funded a lot of militant groups in Syria, such as ISIL and Jabhat al-Nusra. Germany's international development minister said publicly last year that you have to ask who is arming, who is financing ISIL. The key word there is Qatar. U.S. Vice President Joe Biden has said Gulf countries were, quote, so determined to take down Assad that they, quote, poured hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of tons of weapons into the hands of al-Nusra and al-Qaeda. This is not a true or not an, uh, not a true uh, statement. If you want to know who is supporting ISIL, then you have to focus on the regime itself. The regime is the one who been acting as a magnetic to have uh, ISIL in Syria. 
and uh, we are uh, in an ally coalition against the terrorists in Syria, and we are with so the, the U.S. Vice President doesn't know what he's talking about. No, when he we says are that. we are with the United States in a coalition. The against Vice the President group. said Gulf countries poured money and weapons he into the hands of Jabhat al-Nusra. No, no, he, he didn't. He didn't mention. He didn't mention Qatar. I mean, cap my capacity here, I can speak about Qatar. So other Gulf countries may no, have done so. No, 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 no. I can tell you uh, that uh, we consider uh, ISIL and Jabhat al-Nusra. Are, uh, uh, and the German or. minister who said Qatar is behind financing ISIL? I think we have we have received an apology from the German government about okay. what his, their minister have said. You know. Okay. Uh, well, look, you they say consider this. They consider this an uh, individual statement okay. and does not belong to the government. So, put aside the German minister and the U.S. vice president. You say you have nothing to do with ISIL or Jabhat al-Nusra, but you have said you're working with Ahrar al-Sham. In fact, you've said Ahrar al-Sham are one of the honourable rebel groups in Syria despite the fact that this is a hardline group which has rejected democracy, which shares its commanders with al-Qaeda in Syria, shares the same, quote, end goal as ISIL, a so-called Islamic State, and which has been accused of war crimes by Human Rights Watch, of gunning down children, of hostage-taking. You have no problems working with a group you like are, that? You are evaluating them as such? Or that who's is on, on, on their them? basis of what they've said. Ahrar al-Sham is a Syrian uh, uh, liberated uh, group. And they are among other Syrian army, among other Syrian. The group. leader of Ahrar al Sham told Al Jazeera that we share the same end goal as ISIL, an Islamic State. We only disagree on tactics. Uh, That's the group you're they supporting. They don't. They have different ideology, uh, Mahdi. That's not and what he's Ahrar saying. Ahrar al Sham is a moderate group. A moderate uh, group are, whose founder, Abu Khalid al Suri, s declared publicly that he was the representative of Ayman al Zawahiri, the Al Qaeda leader in Syria. No, they have nothing to do with I can guarantee you that they have no link. But whatsoever. they're saying they have links. No, no, this is. You're saying they don't have no, links. No, no, we, the leaders of Ahrar al Sham are saying am, we have links. I am telling you, I am telling you that Ahrar al Sham is a Syrian group. Uh, they look for their uh, liberation and they are working amongst another uh, moderate group. And so when the leader of Ahrar al-Sham tells Al Jazeera, as he did in 2013, that democracy is governing people according to the rules they please, we don't agree with democracy, is he lying? You cannot have democracy off the shelf and just ask the people to have your democracy. Their goal is to bring the regime down because of by, the brutality. By killing women and children, according, no, no, to, no, no. I according didn't. to Human Rights Watch report of October 2013, entire families were gunned down by rebel groups including Ahrar al-Sham. Uh, rest assured, if Ahrar al-Sham committed such uh, crimes as you are mentioning, then they will have a firm stand from the countries who consider them Syrian. I don't think Ahrar al-Sham committed any of these crimes. Okay, well, you're here... I'm not here to defend Ahrar al-Sham, by the way. You are defending no, them. No, no, not to defend them. I'm saying, saying, I'm saying Ahrar al-Sham is among the other moderate groups who are struggling for their freedom. I have to be clear on this. You've said you want to see a democratic Syria, uh, a very noble goal. I think many people would agree with you on that. But given Qatar isn't a democracy itself, some people might say it's a bit rich for you to lecture others in the region on the need for democracy. What more democracy you want than we have the best uh, health uh, uh, care system, the best education and... That's uh, not the, the definition highest, of democracy with no, no. respect, but what do you, want you don't people, have democratic if elections. The people, if you, you don't have an elected head no, of government. No, but this is not, this is not accurate. We have our uh, constitution, and there is in the constitution there will be, a con there will be an elected uh, shura. We are uh, progressing. We are improving. I think you've postponed elections two or three times already. No, this is, technica this is technicalities. So who in the Qatari government is elected? No, you have municipality are fully elected. The no, local they municipality don't, they don't control the country. The emir no, no, and no, people like yourself they, control no, the country. No, but they are they are well here. They are well listened to. But that's not the definition but of a democracy. You're tell not me, a tell democracy. me, tell me, do you want the democracy that's uh, exported, imported? This no. is the democracy you want. I don't want anything. We I'm just have, asking you a question. No, no, you we, say you want democracy we have in Syria. Our own, we have, so I'm saying why not have democracy in Qatar first? We have mm -hmm. our own democracy, which everybody is happy with. We have, as I told you, we have. So would the, you be happy with a Qatari-style democracy in Syria? We have our. If they if they have their Qatari style, then well, they will be. Uh, this will be a good uh, model. You know, we have but no best, one in the world best, will consider it democratic with best, respect for minister. You have best, no one in the world best health, is a democracy. Best health system, best education, 
uh, the highest uh, uh, income per capita. China has one more? of the best school system in the world. No one considers what China to be a more? democracy. Well, this is from your view, but the Chinese people think that their country is democracy. Well, then so President Assad can say my country is a democracy. There's no, no independent measure. No, Everyone's no, a democracy. No, no, let me, we have to differentiate something, Mahdi. Yeah. You know, you don't bomb uh, your no, people no. and kill 300,000 and, and you say I'm and a he's an abhorrent you And he's an abhorrent leader for doing that. I'm talking about the system. No, no, no. The system, the system is elections is what the, defines the a democracy. System was, uh, the system was uh, needed in Syria as uh, 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 minor reforms at the time when Dar'a started, and the Assad did not do it. Agreed. They did not want to throw Assad out of the, of the system. They just wanted a minor reforms, which he rejected, and he faced his people with the nozzle of the gun. This is the story. Agreed. And what he's done, everyone agrees, war crimes have gone on in Syria. Uh, what are people supposed to make uh, of Qatar when a non-violent poet, Muhammad al-Ajami, is locked up there for 15 years for simply reciting a poem that the government didn't like, while a Saudi preacher, Saad bin Atiq al atiq is invited into Doha's Grand Mosque and onto Qatari state TV to say that Christians, Jews, Alawites, Shias should be destroyed. You arrest the poet, but not the preacher of hate. No, this is proof something to you that in Qatar we have a freedom of speech and uh, everybody can express himself freely. This has happened. There is a breach uh, in, in the state who, uh, who has called last year to burn the Quran and kill the Muslims and nobody put him in jail or anything. He was expressing himself and this is a fact. For Al-Ajmi is a different case. Al-Ajmi has violated a criminal code in Qatar so by violating the code with the poem, he's, ex he's arrested and prosecuted. But somebody who says destroy Christians, Jews, Alawites, and Shias on state TV, you don't, you don't no, want to arrest him? No, no, he was, he was expressing his individual. It's wrong what on he state, said. On a Qatari no, no, state TV, you don't said, get on there on But he's own. not there anymore. He, he's, he's not allowed he to. He won't be allowed anymore? No, no, this preacher from Sadriq? Did, did you hear about him after that speech? One of the big issues and worries about uh, the Middle East right now is the division between Iran and some of the uh, Gulf countries, some of the other Middle East nations. The Emir of Qatar at the UN last uh, month said he wanted to host a dialogue uh, initiative between the Gulf states and Iran. Uh, and that would be welcome, I'm sure, to a lot of people who want to see the two sides sitting down. What do you want to see discussed at that initiative? A lot of people say that the split between you guys is religious, it's theological, it's Sunni Shia. Is that what you're going to be debating, the sectarian split in the region? This is, this is a good question. Uh, we don't see the dispute with Iran in the region as Sunni Shia, I think. We never had this before 2003, by the way, a Sunni Shia division. What we are seeing and what we are fearing is an Arab-Persian uh, conflict, which we want to avoid. This is why His Highness the Emir has uh, called for initiative for a dialogue. Uh, I believe with, uh, with, uh, uh, with this uh, opportunity, we will have uh, to discuss all files, uh, security files, good neighborhood, the uh, interfering in, in, in other states, uh, internal affairs. I think uh, uh, the, uh, the other side, the Iranian, uh, has to calm down the, 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 the language, uh, so to help uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, to help uh, to facilitate for a dialogue. So if there is a dialogue, the dialogue should be a serious one to cover all the aspects of a good neighborhood uh, state. Uh, there's been lots of controversy surrounding Qatar's hosting of the World Cup in 2022, allegations of corruption among others. You've said that racism uh, is what's driving these attacks, the idea of a Muslim or Arab country hosting the World Cup. Many of your critics would say that the racism isn't against Qatar, it's by Qatar, against migrant workers from Nepal, Bangladesh, India, who are treated in really awful conditions, who are dying in, in, in their hundreds every year because Qatari authorities don't value their lives. That's the criticism aimed at Qatar on, on, in terms of racism. Well, this is, uh, this is out of context, uh, criticism, actually. Since 2013, we've been working uh, to improve all aspects of the, uh, you know, our guests, uh, worker who are helping us in developing our country. Uh, today, we have 1.8 1 1 uh, million uh, worker who are helping Qatar to develop, not only for the 2022, we have the vision for 2030, and they are uh, uh, supporting about 1.3 million family 
in their But you would agree that conditions need to be improved. We are improving. And who says that we are not improving? We well, started well, the independent review that you commissioned, the Qatari government on labor laws, said yes. that your government should call for a comprehensive independent study into the number of migrant worker deaths by sudden cardiac arrest. You haven't done that. No, no, we did. We have, we have an independent study by DLA Piper. But they're, they the, ones, but they're they the ones who said you need to now do a study. Yeah, which we are doing, which okay. we are doing. And then we when will find that be out, released? And then we find out that all this... Uh, uh, incident which this reports comes from uh, that they are not only because of the two, uh, 2023 uh, 2022 and last one Greg Dyke what do you say to the chairman of the English Football Association Greg Dyke who thinks we won't see a Qatar World Cup that you'll be stripped of it once the Swiss authorities complete their criminal investigation he says you're not going to get the World Cup I want to away. see I want to see his face when we host the 2022 when we won the 2022 Mahdi we won we won it because we presented the best file ever and I said this before, and I'll keep saying this. And we deserve to have a 2022 World Cup in Qatar, in an Arabic state, in an Arabic Islamic country. The Arabic region need such a tournament for the youth of the Arab region. And I think we deserve to have one. For a minister, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Mahdi, thank you very thank much. You. Many of us like to laugh at conspiracy theorists, people who think the moon landings never happened. Obama was born in Kenya. The world is controlled by the Illuminati. But there's one group of conspiracy theorists we should be taking much more seriously, the climate change deniers. Despite the overwhelming scientific evidence showing climate change is real, is caused by humans and endangers our collective future on this planet, these particular conspiracy theorists haven't quite got the message. I do not believe that human activity is causing these dramatic changes to our climate. I have never seen any credible evidence that anything out of the historical ordinary is happening to the climate. I am not a believer in climate change. They're ignoring the scientific consensus. Now, the deniers say it's not true that 97% of climate scientists agree on the science. They're right. It's actually 99.9%. But apparently the whole thing is a hoax, a conspiracy. Don't take my word for it. Listen to what Professor Richard Lindzen, hero of the deniers, told me when I asked him why so many scientific institutes have drawn attention to climate change. They've been told, issue a statement on this. They They've often, been told by who? Well, <laughs> I'd rather not say. Sorry, what? Are we seriously expected to believe that the hundreds of organizations and individuals warning about the danger of climate change, including the United Nations, the World Health Organization, the World Meteorological Organization, NASA, the Pentagon, at least 36 Nobel laureates, and the National Academies of Science of more than 60 different countries, including China, Russia, Mexico, Japan, Brazil, Indonesia, the UK, the US, have all got together in secret to conspire, collude, and dupe the people of the world on the say-so of some unnamed shadowy force. Think about it. That's what would have to be true in order for climate change not to be true. Unfortunately, Lindzen isn't alone. It's very, very cold out, very unseasonal. So here, Mr. President, catch this. Mm -hmm. What the snowball-flinging former chairman of the Senate Environment Committee and other deniers don't seem to understand is weather is not the same thing as climate. Oh, and while we're on the subject, 14 of the 15 warmest years on record have occurred since 2000. Look, other conspiracy theorists make fools of themselves, but they don't harm anyone else. That isn't the case here, because climate change costs lives. And so climate change deniers are undermining the battle to save those lives and to protect our planet. They may be nuts, but it's still no laughing matter. With the killings of unarmed black men by white police officers in the United States becoming all too common, many are demanding change. And can you blame them when you see videos like this one from a South Carolina classroom that went viral around the world this week? The Black Lives Matter movement emerged in 2013 as a call to action and has since become a phenomenon. One of the leading voices behind this movement is DeRay Mekison. He joins me now from Los Angeles. Um, DeRay, thanks for joining me in the arena. Black Lives Matter, that's the name of the campaign. Uh, explain to people watching around the world why it bothers you and other African-American activists so much when people in positions of authority, especially white people in power, say, well, yes, Black Lives Matter, 
but all lives matter. What's wrong with saying that in your view? Yeah, so we know that if all lives matter, we actually wouldn't be in the street. If all lives matter, the police wouldn't be killing black people at record numbers. You know, the police have killed about 900 people this year in all states but three and, um, and have killed someone every day this year except for 15 days. So, you know, we don't go to a, a, a sort of a breast cancer walk and say that like all cancer matters. We're focusing on one issue and this issue is squarely about black lives right now because we know that uh, the violence of the police is disproportionately targeted there. Um, is the fact that we're now seeing the Black Lives Matter campaign resonate globally? Uh, for example, in Brazil, you have the Young Black Alive campaign challenging police killings there. Is that a sign of your campaign's success? Uh, or is it simply a reflection of the fact that discrimination and racial violence uh, on the part of state agencies continues to be a global unresolved problem? Yeah, so this issue has is a global problem around uh, how blackness and anti-blackness is treated. You know, I think that what the Black Lives Matter movement did is that it opened up space so people realized that they were not alone anymore and that this issue was affecting so many people both here in America and across the country and the world. Hundreds of black people have been killed by the police in the United States in 2015 alone. Uh, some people say, look, you guys in the Black Lives Matter campaign, you're good at doing protests, you're good at doing viral videos, but do you have any practical uh, policy proposals, legislative steps, which will help cut the number of those innocent black deaths? Yep, so we launched uh, Campaign Zero, which is a comprehensive platform to end police violence a, a few months ago, and that has been well received in the protest what community kind of things and across are you the country. By Yep, so it's a 10-point ten, ten plan, but it is a fair police union contract. So a lot of the police union contracts almost guarantee police officers will never be held accountable. And then the stuff that you've heard, so like body cameras, uh, independent investigators, making sure that they, we end for-profit policing, um, a use of force standard that is much more restrictive. So it's a whole host of things. And what's key to it is this idea that like no one solution will end police violence, but all of them working together will actually end police violence. You became very well known uh, when you went on Wolf Blitzer's CNN show and refused, uh, despite much prompting from Mr. Blitzer, uh, to condemn uh, black riots, uh, violence by Black Lives Matter protesters or, or, or associated supporters. I'm not going to try and get you to concede um, something you so adamantly refused to do on CNN, but I do want to ask you this. Do you think it helps your cause in terms of perception at least? when white America sees a prominent uh, black activist like yourself refusing to condemn violence against people and property on live television. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm reminded that protest is as American as America itself, that when we think about the Revolutionary War, the Boston Tea Party, and so many other important pivotal moments in America that have changed the course of the country, um, that there is a theme around protest. And, and I think about what happened in Ferguson, I think about what happened in Baltimore, and being a legacy of people. I don't think anyone's sort of questioning the protest against the angle, it's the violence angle. Do you think there's a theme of violence in American history which you're part of? Yeah, so I'd say that the, the only people that have been violent since August have been uh, the police. So when I, if you're talking about property damage, again, I would say that this issue of property damage is a complex one, and I would posit the Revolutionary War and the Boston Tea Party as two important moments for property damage. Uh, you, you don't seem to be con condemning those acts when we talk about it, but when it's black bodies at stake, um, it seems but, to be but a crisis But is property damage violence in your view? No, I think they're two different things. I think the violence is like an attack against people. So if you're, um, a, a, sense if in, you're uh, a Hispanic or a Chinese shop owner and your shop is smashed in by protesters supporting Black Lives Matter campaigns, you shouldn't be upset about it because it's all for the greater good. So let's be, so you are like f twisting the word. So that wasn't the question. The question is, is it violent? I said, and I'm not condoning, like I said to Wolf, I don't have to condone it to understand it. I'm saying that property damage and violence are two very different things. Um, and again, the police have been violent since August. They have killed people. Yes, the protesters have. have not. Yes, they have. Right. So when I think about this property damage, uh, what I'm saying to you is that, um, again, there's a uh, this is situated in a context in American protest. So if you are frustrated by the property damage in Baltimore and in Ferguson, I would hope that you are also frustrated about the Boston Tea Party and the Revolutionary War. Given that racism is still out of control in America, given there is this horrific violence uh, disproportionately targeting black communities, especially from the police, um, and given you do have a black president, do you think that black president has done enough um, to tackle? Has it got better or worse or stayed the same on his watch, this racism that you have rightly identified? Yeah, so I think that there is something powerful about a black man being in the presidency, but we also know that these issues um, 
are important to address at like the local and state level as well. So there's uh, so there's some things that President Obama can do that it, that will be important that have been important. I'm interested to see how his term will end, um, given that you know he's seemingly more aggressive about race and criminal justice at the end of his term than he was uh, for those initial years. But so um, far, but I'm also have interested things got in better or worse on his watch so far? I think that better or worse is like a, an interesting metric. I think that, like I, like I said, I'm interested to see how it'll end. Um, he has become much more aggressive about the issue of race and policing and criminal justice in the last two months in a way that he has not been that's for a very, so long. That's a very good um, politician's way of answering my question. So let me ask you this. Do you have any plans to go into politics, stand for office? You know, I am. Uh, I have plans to figure out how to support people to end police violence, and I think that there are many ways to do that. Um, that is a fantastic politician's answer. DeRay, thanks so much for joining me from Los Angeles. Cool, good to be here. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week. <laughs>